In this video we'll be covering C5, chemicals of the natural environment, and there are three main strands. The first one is ionic bonding, the second one is covalent bonding, and the third one involves extraction of metals, and in that section we'll look at metallic bonding too. So let's first look at ionic bonding. Ionic bonding involves giving or taking electrons to form positive or negative ions, which can then attract each other. And we're looking mainly at the hydrosphere when we talk about ionic bonding in this module. And the hydrosphere is the sphere of the Earth, and we tend to be talking about rivers, lakes, seas and oceans, basically places where water is found and dissolved salts. So, the formula of a number of salts has to be known in this exam. So you know, need to know um, sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, magnesium sulfate, sodium sulfate, potassium chloride, and potassium bromide. So you must know those amongst others and know how to work them out. So potassium chloride has simply K plus and Cl minus to form KCl, and the same for potassium bromide. Whereas in sodium sulfate, you've got an Na plus and an SO4 2 minus group. Remember the, yes, the sulfate is SO4 2 minus. And you see here what I'm doing on each example is writing the charges and using the crossover method. So you draw arrows to show that the charges cross over to give you the number of atoms in the ionic compound. So you see there's one positive and one negative charge. So when you cross them over, you have one sodium and one chloride. Now, there are tests for ionic um, ions and they work because ions have distinct properties from each other. So for example, sodium and chlorine have very different properties, even though they're both ions. And they form compounds such as sodium chloride, again with distinct unique properties. And tests can tell you which ions are present based on those properties. So there are positive ions, which are metals, and negative ions, which are non-metals. So if you add sodium hydroxide to a metal, the metal will form a metal hydroxide. And if this metal hydroxide is insoluble, um, it comes out of solution and forms a coloured precipitate. And the colour of that precipitate can tell you a bit about um, which ion it is. Whereas for a negative ion, you can react a reagent, such as silver nitrate and so on. And the reagent um, reacts with the negative ions to form an insoluble solution, or solid, sorry, in the solution. And again, you'll see a precipitate. So, here I'm drawing um, sodium and chlorine. And I'm showing that the sodium gives up one electron to form a full outer shell. And the chlorine takes the electron to form a full outer shell. And now you've got a chloride ion, which is negative, because it's gained an electron, and a sodium ion is positive. And now there's opposite charges, and therefore an electrostatic force, pulling the sodium plus and the chloride minus ion together. Um, and this doesn't happen once. This happens many times, because there are hundreds and hundreds of chloride and sodium ions forming a lattice. I'm trying to draw a 3D structure there, although it's not very clear. And it shows that each sodium is bound to six different chloride ions and vice versa. So, if you apply a force to one of those rows of the crystal and you move the sodium to be adjacent to another sodium, there would be like charges facing each other which repel, like north and north magnets repel. And therefore, the crystal would shatter. So when you push a crystal or you force a crystal, it tends to break before it bends due to that repulsion, and it's said to be brittle. It's got a giant ionic structure, which means it doesn't conduct when solid, because there are no free ions to move. And it's also got a high boiling point and a high melting point, because it's very hard to break those six bonds for every sodium or chloride ion. You need a very high temperature to break them. So, when dissolving, the ions in the formula dissociate or separate. So in sodium chloride, another example, um, the sodium ion and the chloride ion separate and are surrounded by water, because water has a very tiny polarity, or very tiny charge. And those water molecules surround in, in different directions, 
the hydrogen is facing the chlorine and the oxygen is facing the sodium and that prevents them from rejoining and forming a solid and therefore they are dissolved and we write the symbol AQ to symbolize aqueous dissolved in water. So now let's look at covalent bonding. So we've got simple and giant covalent bonding as opposed to the giant ionic bonds we looked at earlier. When we look at simple covalent bonds, a good example would be in the air. And there are different gases in the air, for example, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, which has 21%, and nitrogen has 78%. Argon makes up 1%, and carbon dioxide is 0.04%. And please note, argon is not diatomic because it's got a fill out of shell already, but the other gases are diatomic. So, gases in the air have a very low melting point and a very low, low boiling point, and we know that because they're gases. They're not liquids, they're not solids. They've already evaporated, they've already melted, even at room temperature. So, in an oxygen molecule, there are very strong covalent bonds, a double covalent bond. And we see I've drawn a few molecules there, separate molecules. And the green lines represent very weak intermolecular bonds, which are much weaker than the covalent bonds between the atoms in the molecule. So, strong intramolecular bonds, weak intermolecular bonds, and therefore easily broken by a low temperature, and those oxygen molecules separate out, forming a gas. So now we can look at the structures of simple molecular compounds. Nitrogen has a triple bond, so we draw three lines. Oxygen has a double bond, so we draw two lines. And fluorine forms a single bond, we draw one line. And I'm showing, showing you now a dot and cross diagram to show how those electrons are shared. So for nitrogen, it's showing three pairs of electrons, and therefore both nitrogen atoms in the, in the molecule have a full outer shell and each of them is only showing, um, showing three electrons each so the three pairs there and that's why it's a triple bond the same story in oxygen except there are two pairs of electrons now rather than three and therefore a double bond and fluorine only shares a single pair of electrons so it's a single bond so if I draw methane I can draw it as a 2D structure CH4 showing you the hydrogens around the carbon or a 3D structure which would be CH4, but it shows you um, the structure. And we should mention that covalent bonds are electrostatic, electrostatic attractions uh, between the nuclei, or the protons in the nuclei, and the electrons, and the electrons are shared. And this means that covalent substances do not conduct when pure, because they're not charged, and they usually happen between non-metal and non-metal, for example, fluorine and fluorine, carbon and hydrogen. So, let's talk about minerals now. Minerals are extracted from the Earth, in the lithosphere and if I draw the structure of the earth we see that the inside has the inner core and the outer core um, made of iron then we've got magma which is molten rock and we've got mantle and above the mantle is the crust and that's where you find most of our minerals in the lithosphere and there are different types of minerals three we have to remember are diamond graphite and silicon dioxide and they're all examples of giant covalent structures so diamond's got a tetrahedral structure so it's hard, it's insoluble because there are no ions, it doesn't conduct electricity because there are no free electrons, and it's got a very high melting point and a high boiling point because there are so many covalent bonds, very strong covalent bonds, uh, between each carbon atom. Graphite also has a high melting and boiling point. It's also um, very strong, but the layers, um, in, within the layer, but between the layers it's quite soft, and it conducts electricity, and we'll find out why in a second. So... As I mentioned earlier, um, graphite has layers, and between those carbons I'm drawing, there are very, very strong um, covalent bonds, but the blue lines show really weak intermolecular bonds between the different layers. So even though you can't break the carbon to carbon bonds very easily, you can separate the layers quite easily, because the intermolecular bonds are really weak compared to the intramolecular bonds. And that's why graphite was soft, because the, the layers can separate easily, and it's why when you draw the pencil, the layers come off into the page. Gr uh, diamond has no layers, and therefore it's not soft, it's very, very strong. Um, graphite has free electrons as well between the layers, and therefore it can conduct. And now we'll look at extracting metals. So, metallic bonding. Um, again, like ionic and giant covalent, it's got a giant structure, and it has very strong metallic bonds. Basically, I'm drawing some positive ions there, metal ions, surrounded by a sea of delocalized or free negative electrons. 
and those electrons can move freely between the different ions and it's that attraction between the positive and the negative electrons the electrostatic attraction and that gives it a very strong structure now those free electrons allow the metal to conduct electricity as they can flow through the substance carrying charge and if you apply a force to a metal those positive ions can actually slip over each other and the electrons are free to move so they allow this to happen and therefore you can bend the metal as they are malleable unlike the ionic crystals whereby if you try to bend it um, the repulsion effect would be overwhelming and it would shatter and be brittle so let's talk about reduction and oxidation of some metals Things like copper, things like iron, can be reduced by adding carbon and heating. And you see the equation there, where copper oxide um, becomes copper, the oxygen bound to the copper, joins onto the carbon and forms carbon dioxide. Um, so the copper is losing oxygen, it's reduced, and the carbon is gaining oxygen, so it's oxidized, and therefore you get a pure form of the substance. But things like aluminium, which are much more reactive than carbon, cannot be reduced in this manner because carbon is not reactive enough to pull the oxygen off so instead of that we have to do an, a more technical process called electrolysis or using electricity to break apart the um, formula into ions and we need electrodes that are positive and negative electrodes and I'm just drawing in a tube there that the um, aluminium can leak out of to be collected and the aluminium is dissolved in a substance called cryolite now if you try to melt aluminium you would need a uh, temperature of about 2000 degrees but with cryolite molten cryolite aluminium dissolves and it's only at a thousand degrees so it's a it's, it's half the energy usage and therefore uh, twice as cheap if you use cryolite as a, a solvent so we're drawing some aluminium 3 plus ions there and some oxygen 2 minus ions there and the aluminium 3 plus ions will be attracted to the positive electrode or the cathode and I remember that cations are positive so cathodes are negative um, whereas the oxygen 2 minus ions are attracted to the anode which is obviously positive now the positive electrode is made of graphite which is carbon And when the aluminium goes to the negative electrode, it forms a, a molten liquid and it can pour out. And we see that the, the, those carbon um, anodes actually react with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. And they need to be replaced quite regularly, which adds to the cost of the production. So now I'm drawing the half equation. I'm showing you that basically aluminium forms a 3 plus ion, as is in group 3. And when the positive charge of the aluminium reaches the negative electrode, it gains three electrons and therefore is reduced so reduction is a gain in electrons and it forms an aluminium atom which then um, can be taken out and extracted now at the anode um, the opposite happens oxygen is oxidized because um, electrons are removed as it's already got electrons extra on it and as the electrons are removed it forms oxygen which then reacts to form carbon dioxide with the graphite um, electrode so, why do we need metals? Metals are malleable, and it's due to the, the metallic bonds allowing the positive ions to move over each other. It's got a high melting point, so therefore it can be used in things that have high temperatures, and it conducts electricity. Thank you for watching my video. Good luck in the exams, and please leave a comment if you get the chance. Thank you.